Thank you very much for everybody to participate in this session. I'm not sure how many times I did a panel discussion at G1, but I always found that uh, you know the this time allocation just after lunch is very difficult to uh, keep people uh, awake. But uh, you know. But uh, I think uh, today I'm very fortunate because uh, the, we have uh, four distinguished, uh, uh, you know, panelists. Um, I'm sure that uh, they uh, they can keep you uh, uh, awake. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the, at G1 we do we, we do not uh, introduce ourselves, uh, but uh, instead of doing that, I like uh, have a uh, uh, first question, which is uh, uh, to each of panelists. Uh, uh, my question is: What is your uh, activities or life in the past and currently? Uh, in relation with design. Maybe, uh, Chris, uh, you, you want to start with? Sure. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Uh, let's see. My Where are my activities? I'll start with past activities. I feel like design has always been a part of, of my life. I grew up in a kind of an artist and photography household, um, and I found my way into some fortunate areas where I met Tom Kelly almost 30 years ago. I was five, no, <laughs> then uh, at a place called IDEO um, and was, has been very fortunate in subsequent environments to be in um, a learning environment, which is, I think is a core part of being uh, a designer. I think of myself always as, as a designer, even though I have an MBA and I've done other, other um, kind of uh, different disciplines in, in my life, but uh, a colleague of of Tom and I, he, he always asks us the passport question, not which country, but what occupation you put on your passport. And since I've had a passport, I've always put designer on, on the passport. So I think that's, that's something that is carried, carried forward. Today, we start to think about um, design at the intersection of design and business. I think I started my career thinking about design for business as a service to, to business. We were design was, was kind of down the stack um, and we've tried to elevate ourselves in, in, in that. And I think as you start to change that preposition, so design for business, design of businesses, and then designs of, of ventures and ecosystems, that's kind of how I've, I've thought about integrating these, these different uh, designs. But design has always been a, an integrating discipline, um, and um, no matter what other fields or collaborations you're, you're working with. So that brings me to where my, my relationship to this group in Japan is, I currently run an innovation center um, for with SRI, sponsored with um, and partnered with Nomura, um, focusing on connecting Japan and Silicon Valley. And we do that through um, uh, bringing uh, Japanese corporate and innovators and entrepreneurs to Silicon Valley and, and try to show them the, the path towards uh, disruptive innovation. So that is my short and long story. Thank you. So, hi, my name is Ari Horie. Um, I was actually born and raised in Hiroshima. Um, I started in my life in the United States as an exchange student, and about nine years ago, I started um, Women's Startup Lab, focusing on women, uh, tech entrepreneur, to rise and succeed through collaboration. Um, while I was doing that, I also realized that the entrepreneur I have to help is women who already made it. And there's a thousands and thousands of women just didn't make it to the accelerator level. So last two years, I've been focusing on a nonprofit Women Startup Lab Impact Foundation. And with that, I can help a larger number of women. And last year, I have received the fund from US government to help women uh, and girls in Japan to learn about entrepreneurship and a mindset. So I was very fortunate to spend a, a year in Japan to develop the program. And uh, you know, we were talking about design and I, I consider myself not necessarily accelerator founder, but I always been more of a social engineer. The question become what is not working in our society? Where is not uh, being designed in a way that not fully, um, fully functioning? And the women has been a big section of all our interest. And so Accelerator has been just a way for me to design a way the way a woman can contribute a benefit for, not just for women, but for our society. 
And so specifically for last year, my activity has been uh, helping women um, and also high school students. But it's been very interesting to really dig in on Japanese mindset. That's different than entrepreneur mindset that I was already, people are already in the United States. So again, you know, digging deeper, uh, the button that you have to push to create next to uh, chapters or courage to take on risk, uh, buttons very different for Japanese women uh, than let's say uh, US uh, cultured uh, people. So it's been very interesting and that's what I kind of uh, bring to the table. Thank you, Horie san I think uh, the, uh she mentioned about the mindset. Mindset is, uh, you know, I always uh, uh, key, uh, you know, key, uh, key words for particular for design because uh, when we say design, it's uh, a little bit different uh, from uh, who, who you are, right? Japanese, American, and also redesigners world, but more entrepreneurs. So we can come back to that mindset uh, part again. Uh, okay, Tom, my. Sure. Uh, um, uh, closest American to me is Tom Kelly. Please. Thank you, Mac. Very sweet. So, uh, it's hard to, hard to follow that quick introduction. But, um, <laughs> so, I love this idea of mindset, by the way. I, I write books about design and innovation, and I wrote a book that did really well, uh, made the New York Times bestseller list. And the book I wrote was called Creative Confidence, but in Japan, it's called Creative Mind Setto. <laughs> so uh, the, our publisher, Nikkei, in Japan thought it's really about a mindset, which I think I agree with. So as far as design in my life, I mean, it's just permeated my life and my career. I've been at IDEO for 36 years. I've spent the last uh, six of those years working with Mac at D4V, our venture firm in Tokyo, investing in mostly Japanese startups. And in case you haven't already guessed, the D in D4V is for design. It's design for ventures. And so what we do is we invest in these uh, Japanese startup companies. And then IDEO, what I think of as one of the leading design firms in the world, you can, you can be your own judge. IDEO then, for free, helps um, provide design services to help some of those companies succeed. And so we've got the combination of design and ventures. Uh, and so what, one thing that IDEO has tried to do from the, the beginning is stretch the definition of design. Because in the old days, it was like fashion design or it was product design. And we've tried to stretch it to everywhere. So IDEO deeply believes that climate change is a design challenge. And we're hosting big groups. This is Climate Week, and we're hosting big groups at IDEO from government and business to talk uh, about climate. But I think the ultimate in this design challenge thing is designing your life. You know, it, it is the most popular course at the Stanford D School. There's a book and a workbook now for this designing your life course. And I use some of the elements of designing your life and I drew this giant mind map of what I should do next in my life. And one of the words in that mind map was Japan. And that took me to Japan in, in meeting Mac Takano who had visited me in Palo Alto and that, in turn, led to the formation of D4V. So this designing your life, it's worth at least looking into. Thank you very much. Patty, please. So I started designing when I was a little girl and was handed a pad of paper. And I was one of those kids that designed architecture, the houses I wanted to live in. Um, and I actually went to school. I went to Berkeley to become an architect. but. I never practice. To this day, one of my favorite things to, to do is, is if I'm driving to the city, I give myself a problem to solve in the one hour commute. Or if I'm on a plane, I always have a pad of paper. And I'm, there's a puzzle, there's a bunch of puzzles that I've set forth for me to solve in that cross country, cross ocean trip. And that's when I get my nerd on, is solving a puzzle with a blank piece of paper. Um, so what I've been doing, I, I started one of my first companies um, when I was in Japan. I received a venture fund funding from a Japanese company to start a business in America. And it just went public last summer. Um, I also have um, an eyeglass company because um, 
in, in the, my other company, I bill by the hour, and I felt I was um, costing my clients so much money because I couldn't read the fine print. It was, I was getting old, I, but I didn't want to admit it. So I went to CVS and I turned the carousel and I kept turning it and I'm so vain. There was no way I was gonna wear any of those grandmotherly glasses. So um, I design and manufacture eyeglasses mm. as well. Good, good. Okay, um, then I wanna ask uh, the uh, some uh, uh, additional question. Uh, maybe I should start with the design thinking because, uh, as you know, design thinking is now very popular uh, words. But that's, I believe that uh, design thinking uh, word also uh, the uh, idea came from uh, original ideal, right? Then uh, maybe Chris or uh, Tom, uh, please explain how did you uh, came up with the idea and the word. I think IDEO, what one thing IDEOers share is this kind of love and almost dogma around process. And so we go into a room or we start a project with a blank piece of paper or a client and we kind of want to say like, how are we going to do this before we start actually doing? And it, and it started, I think, out of a desire to have a common, as, as IDEO was originally industrial designers and mechanical engineers trying to great, create great products, when we added the discipline which I joined with, which was the merger of design and psychology called human factors, we tried to had, had to figure out how to all play well together and we needed a process and a way to describe that. So that was originally, we used the, the words human-centered design um, and user-centered design and, um, and then it, and it grew, grew from there. And as I was saying to the, to the panelists earlier, any uh, good designers and innovators uh, and entrepreneurs are good at borrowing and stealing from everybody else. Mm -hmm. So IDEO certainly did a, a bit of that in trying to take the best of design process and definitely coined the, the, the phrase design thinking. And I think one of the, as I look back on it, it's a very empowering process. We gave it away. So it was one, one odd thing as a group of consultants to kind of give away your secret sauce. But we actually wanted more people to think like we did so that we could collaborate um, together. The dirty secret is then we, I think we wanted to like train our clients to be better clients for, for us, but that's, that's, a, that's another off the record story. But I think des design thinking has been one of those things that we've tried actively to give away and I think is, um, is kind of a toolkit to help people with that mindset whether you, no matter what your background is. I, I think we, you, know, you may not have a design uh, background or craft as an architect or an industrial designer, but you should be able to think like a designer, which helps you uh, collaborate, solve problems, and um, kind of stitch together use cases um, to a value proposition, which I think is a key skill uh, for entrepreneurs, investors, and, and the like. Yeah, one thing that Chris, oh, there we go. One thing that Chris touched on there is about, you know, designers versus not designers. You know, I would say, you know, I, I have been writing about design thinking a lot, starting with a book 23 years ago called The Art of Innovation. And, uh, you know, I've always thought that design thinking was too important to be left to the designers, right? And so the idea of design thinking is it's not this exclusive club. This is something that all business people can practice. And well, our clients who want to bring more creative thought into their organization, if you as a boss say, hey, go and be more creative or go make innovations, it's hard to know where to begin. But design thinking gives you tools and steps and things like that to break it down into its component parts. So like Chris says, we could have held it tight or tried to trademark it or, or, or something, but it's been much more fun this way to see it just go mainstream around the world. I will say it is not as embraced or it is not, um, is not as far along in its application in Japan as it is in some other parts of the world. Like that um, in a US context, I try not to explain to my clients what design thinking is because they'll think I'm telling them stuff they already know, right? Sometimes called mansplaining. So you never want to be um, in the- Design-splaining. Yeah, <laughs> in the mode of doing that. Uh, whereas in Japan, there, it is still something that's happening. We are teaching uh, some of our Japanese clients. We, IDEO has a, a studio in Tokyo, right on a Motesando Boulevard, very nice uh, office, 
one omotesando, um, and we are in some cases teaching people design thinking. But once they learn it, then they can do it on their own or they can do it with, with our help at Idea of Tokyo. Tom, I, I feel that, the, you know, it used to be design thinking, the word of design thinking is very popular, right? Now it's, you know, at, at least at the, at the idea of the we don't use much, uh, rather than uh, uh, design thinking, I feel we do more like a center, uh, human-centric, right? Is yes. that true? Why it happened? Yes, and the, I mean, we haven't really changed the process of design thinking at all, but the more it is used, uh, you know, it has gone through mainstream use, it, um, it loses its specialness as a term. We're not, we're not trying to promote the idea of design thinking. And so some people still believe that design thinking is kind of belongs to IDEO or something, whereas human-centered design just seems, uh, you know, more universally available. So it, it, it's, it's mainly about semantics. We still deeply believe in this process. And, you know, when appropriate, we'll call it design thinking. And when it doesn't feel right, we'll call it human-centered design okay. or something else. Okay, let's, uh, let's switch our topic uh, to effect effectiveness of... Uh design in the business scene. So uh, how it can help for uh, you know, company to grow? Is there anybody who wanna talk about that effectiveness of uh, uh, design uh, with some particular? Um, I, I, I think, it, I mean, uh, sharing a little bit of this past with, with Tom, I think that we, we tried to use design as a way to help companies strategically grow and we're looking for indicators of, of our success. We could tell a good story about it, and you know, but we were trying to sell them more design services. So, um, but we we often looked at um, public stocks that actually had design leadership in their either in their boards or in their management teams. And you can see this kind of era go from maybe 2005 to to 2015 or 2020, and showing how um, design led. Uh, companies and design-led leaders, leadership teams actually were more effective at identifying and being adaptable to, to new markets and, and identifying new opportunities. So I think that that's, that's an indicator. Of, I mean, we can tell individual yes. case stories, but I kind of like to step back and see what do the markets think of, about our impact. Sure. I mean, we've done thousands of projects, so we can point to companies where we, you know, increase their sales by millions. We can talk about startups where we help them get to billion dollar valuations, but it depends on what metric you want to use. So here's a metric that I like, which is um, I, I used to take people on tours of Ideo Palo Alto and I'm taking on a tour one day and I point to this product. It was one of my favorite products at the time. Uh, it's called the Heartstream Defibrillator. It was the very first of the automatic external defibrillators. They have them Oh, sorry. They have them in, uh, in Omotesando Station. They have one of our defibrillators still there, the kind of descendant of the one we designed. So I'm telling this young group is a group of at-risk kids from uh, New Zealand, and I'm telling the story about this product we did uh, that we designed the interface for that, you know, basically restarts your heart if you go into cardiac arrest. And the leader, this guy who I got to know a little bit later, but I was meeting him for the first time, named Simon, he kind of wanders away in a foot, like something's going on over there, but I couldn't, I couldn't figure out what it was. And so at the end of the day, I said, hey, Simon, what was up? Well, what happened there? You know, I was explaining the defibrillator. He says, Tom, I have a 19-year-old daughter. And he said, last year, out of the blue, no sign beforehand, she went into cardiac arrest. He says, your, your, your product saved my daughter's life. He said, I didn't want to cry in front of my boys. That's why I wandered off. So think about the millions you know, of sales that we increased. Think about the billions we've made you know, in valuation for startups. I'll take the Heartstream defibrillator, because that story Simon told me has been repeated tens of thousands of times around the world. And I hear his story, and I think, we did that. I mean, with me the help of many other people, but we saved his daughter's life. So use any metric you want. I've found design to be very valuable out mm. in the world. Thank you. So, Patti, uh, I know that you've been uh, funded, uh, you have uh, funded so many, not so many, but a uh, uh, few uh, companies, right? 
in a uh, in uh, you know managing your company and uh, you made a successful uh, successful IPO you said so and uh, how did you uh, uh, design your company um, you know as a ma as, as a manager as, as a you know board member how did you uh, design to success <laughs> that's a big question um, but I will make a plug for Tom we um, distribute design thinking to every employee. And Tom is on our teaching faculty. He comes in and teaches people how to think, how to ideate, how to think outside of the box. I was um, at the earlier panel discussion, and I heard Arthur talk about take the money. <clears throat> if they offer it, take the money. But um, design can help you in, in the event of an economic downturn as well. <clears throat> Money always helps. So um, one of my favorite stories is um, the event that erased the word startup from our life cycle stage. Um, we faced our first downturn. And a little bit of background about my, this company that was funded when I was living in Japan it is a healthcare consulting company, and our clients are all hospitals. <clears throat> and it's generally thought of, this company is generally thought of as having um, a very high quality product, very good customer service, and the highest prices. <clears throat> and when there's an economic downturn, the first people, oh yeah, yeah. Can I have it? The first people who are let go are the high price consultants. So, um, <clears throat> I was summoned down to talk to the CFO of a large hospital in Los Angeles. And I was summoned down there so she could terminate our contract. And she did it as a kindness to me because she wanted me to know that it wasn't personal. Her board of directors had ordered everybody to terminate all the contracts. Well, I'm a good con consultant, so I came loaded with reasons why she shouldn't terminate our contract. I reminded her that we had conducted training to every hospital, every department in our hospital, so they could be self-sufficient in correcting their own mistakes, but that it made no impact. I wasn't having any, making any impression. So I told her, well, you'll remember, we absorbed all the legal fees for that gigantic litigation process that was returned a huge reward to you. Still no impact. Good thing I saved the best story for last. I said, do you remember the, um, the one focus area all year was on pricing? And we did, free of charge, a pricing study for your hospital. And the prices that you've implemented today are increasing your revenues. And I thought, OK, good. That's all she'll need. No impact. I was desperate. So I blurted out, but did you know that our consultants improve the clinical outcomes of all your patients? Mm -hmm. And she burst out laughing. She, she thought I was joking, but I wasn't laughing, so she stopped laughing. And she said, OK, I know you're a financial consultant. How is it that you impact the clinical outcomes of our clients? And um, so I thought, OK, I'm going to go with this. <clears throat> I told her that um, because our kids, our kids, they're, they're 20s and 30s, they, they travel to her hospital. Um, four days a week, come back on Friday. Um, <clears throat> I said that uh, they give birthday parties for every one of your patients every month at the um, Ronald McDonald House, which is housing for parents who must travel to, for their child to receive treatment. She said, why didn't you tell me this? This was having an impact, so I kept going. I told her that um, on a quarterly basis, the team voluntarily gives blood to your hospital. 
She said, I need to know these kinds of things. I was making an impact. So I said, okay, you know your surgical kits? You use one piece of equipment and you throw away the rest? We recycle all of your surgical kits and we distribute those supplies to community hospitals and to hospitals around the world. So not only are you impacting your own patients, but you're helping patients around the world. And she said, come to work on Monday. I'll deal with the board. Mm -hmm. So um, when you're designing things, this is part of a design. So mm -hmm. our employees are given the power to do team building every month. They have a budget for it. And there's three criteria. It has to be fun. It has to be impactful. And it has to be strategic. And all those team building things that they did fit all those criteria. And we were the only ones left in the market. All of our big major competitors left the company, or left that business, that industry. We had our pick of people on campus. We had our pick of clients across the United States. And we lost the term startup in our business cycle. Thank you, thank you. Wow, it's very, uh, You're uh, hired. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. So, Horiya uh, san uh, I heard that uh, your program is a little different uh, because of, uh, uh, in terms of design, it's because of a woman, or how it's different? Yeah, so, um, first uh, six months uh, when I started Women's Startup Lab, first of all, I didn't start it because I thought I was an expert. I started because I felt there was something needed to happen. And because I saw so many women entrepreneurs leaving Silicon Valley. And so, okay, I can listen, I can talk to people. So first the six months, I spoken to 260 people in the Silicon Valley. Some are investors, some are people who are women leader or some people who's working in the women's empowerment uh, industry. And I keep asking why, 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 just like everybody else do. And I also ask, if there is one systematic program uh, that can be built, what would that organization to do? And so everybody has a different idea. Then that number of information gave me idea what people think, but the what pe perception and the what's the fact. And if some of the fact can be effective, some of the fact it's it's not so effective. Mm -hmm. So some success and some failure. So I wanted to help women entrepreneurs to rise, raise a fund or succeed, whatever the way. And I decided to do accelerator. And I realized the investment only goes less than 3% to women entrepreneur. And there, another study came out and they found out that investor themselves don't realize that they're asking very uh, defensive or more uh, safe question. How are you going to save money in a downturn? Versus uh, toward the male uh, entrepreneur, they will ask, how are you going to make it bigger? Uh, if you have a, um, 10 million right now, what would you do? And so system have kept a certain way. I'm not saying the women are not rising because everybody else's fault. Mm. And so not only everybody else's opinion and perception, and then looking at the number and then social data, um, we start looking at, okay, what is the current accelerator model? And then why women are leaving those accelerator? And I found out that statistically, women do better when they are small group. Mm. Men do better with a competition. Mm. And so in society, we just sometimes needed collaborative cooperation collaborative competition to f help each other and thrive. So our program was designed to mm -hmm. collaborate each other. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a small program. Mm -hmm. um, also, uh, we have a number of advisors, not they're coming in because they're great, not, uh, or many advisors talk about how great they are. Mm -hmm. But I, I specifically, like you were talking about designing your mission, a company, I made it very clear why I chose you. Mm -hmm. and why you have to be here to help other women 
And so they knew why I, what I saw uh, in them. And so when they came, they talk about not what they're so great about, what they have done, but they made sure that every single entrepreneur felt great about what they were doing. And so the conversation became very much of each entrepreneur's strength and how I can help you versus, okay, I'm a great speaker, I'm gonna tell you and goodbye, which then entrepreneur was inspired, but they did not connect how your success and my success is irrelevant. And so we were very micro on specifically, not just the knowledge, but how those each activity leave them, uh, how they felt about themselves. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the other things is like advising. We didn't just have the advisor session. We call it 360 advising session. We have about six advisors in the room and uh, we don't have advisors to give advice. Mm -hmm. Entrepreneur talk, we ask a lot of questions and the entrepreneur actually have to leave the room. Because sometimes when they are speaking with entrepreneur, there's a little bit of a show off of stuff happening mm -hmm. between the advisor. So we have entrepreneur leave and we had a collaborative session among the advisor to discuss what's the best situation that she can gain the uh, fund or whatever the issue. Some uh, advisor knew something, some advisor didn't uh, know, and they start discussing which is a better solution. And so they were start learning, they were collaborating. Then entrepreneur came back. By then, advisor are very uh, um, warmed up. They felt confident their advice. And so even the advisor wasn't poking around, challenging them and like, prove it to me. That wasn't the case. It was like, we agreed, I think your next opportunity is this. So we designed everything in a collaborative mindset and emotional mm -hmm. safety. And it felt like everybody was um, in it and being understood. And so those are just one of the examples. So we look at the how, where women thrive, and we designed that in the program. And then we also brought that to the extended member of uh, our community, which is investor and advisor were briefed and then um, uh, collaborated in that way. So that's just one of the examples. Oh, thank you. Uh, it's, uh, now, I think that what you are talking about is uh, how you are from uh, uh, you know, that, that woman's society in terms of designing, designing uh, of uh, design and mindset maybe. So uh, then uh, in terms of mindsets, I think the, the, the design differ, for example, like uh, between uh, a startup and large population and between uh, Japan and US. Why it, it, it can differ? Uh, I wanna start uh, that, that conversation. First one is my, you know, uh, in, in the United States, when I say design thinking, everybody knows about us, but in Japan, Designs, it's, we, we start with explaining what the design thinking is. So that means that in Japan, that uh, you know, uh, design thinking is not so popular yet, even among uh, startups. So I think three of them are uh, some kind of uh, experience in Japan and compare, can compare the, the, that thing with uh, between Japan and US. So uh, if anybody wanna say something, why it differ? Maybe I just quickly start. Uh, last year, I, I design ran a uh, women entrepreneur training program. I put out the application. Whatever, you know, whoever think you're an entrepreneur who has a revenue, um, apply. Mm -hmm. I didn't use the word startup. And I get application, I look through it. I don't understand what business they are in. It was very like, we change the world and <laughs> we bring the happiness. And I was so confused. And then I go to their website. Website was the same way. I didn't understand what service she provide. Mm. And so I just gave up looking at the application. This is the first time in Japan, right? So our brand isn't established, so everybody has certain interpretations and they come over. And so I said, okay, I don't know anything about Japan, so I'm just gonna meet those women. So I was expecting a number of women, like actually 80, 80 women's gathering at Omotesando and thinking many of them was like, oh, Arisan, can you help us? Kind of like a flowery conversation. Sometimes I get that. And they were serious. Oh. They were so serious. They had a number, they had a presentation. They said, this is what I have done. And then they were very clear how often they failed. Oh. <laughs> but what I have found out is that the society doesn't really welcome them to speak like that. Oh. So they learn to dumb it down. They have this revolutionary system that helps this beauty of some sort. 
Then she'll say, well, it's something to do with the skin and I make people happy. That's how they talk. So it was cultural. <laughs> It was a cultural, so it was important that I have to keep that in mind that they have been slapped or have to fit in to dumb it down until I'm successful like somebody else. Until then, they continue to play dumb game, and we need to create the language and welcome uh, specifically women because a woman being told, "Oh, you have to pretend so that you don't threaten men or you don't speak up," and so you might not know, but um, I don't know. I've been told many times, I can't do that. I don't know how. But um, so things like that, you have to fit in. So, <laughs> so those are the kind of things I, I learned that just because what they say doesn't sound impressive, mm. I almost wrote it uh, out. But the, I, I actually met, I was really impressed that, that their revenue is small, but they are as uh, passionate, as intelligent, and as intentional than I ever thought. So I think there's a huge potential. Uh, it's, I think there's a systematic change. Uh, the point of view has to be changed for women to rise and speak up. Uh -huh. Dom? Yeah, yeah, just to echo that idea, I think you know, b b among both male and female founders that, that come to D4V for investment, um, a, a, a difference that I see between uh, the Japanese startups and the American startups has to do with storytelling. Because our Japanese founders are amazing. They're, they're very smart. They're super dedicated to their businesses. And, you know, sometimes they have a, you know, the core of their business is really fascinating. But they don't, they just don't bring it in the way that a, that a, a U.S. founder would do it. And like, I, I just... You know, sometimes I just want to shake them. Like, are you excited about your company? Because if you're not excited, how am I going to be excited? <laughs> and so I really do believe that in some cases, and this extends to some of our, uh, you know, our larger clients too, and, you know, at IDEO, is the core, the, the, the story inside is amazing, but they just don't always kind of show it on the outside. Oh. So, you know, the, I watched this battle in the early 2000s uh, between Sony, unquestionably the number one consumer electronic company in the world in the year 2000, and Apple, right? And I, I will not say that Apple's products were necessarily better at any time in that process, but they did have a really, really good storyteller, mm. right? And I remember a long time ago, they're just, I think, retiring this pro product, but a long time ago, Steve Jobs held up not this, but the a very early product called an iPod, the, the first original iPod. And it was not, you know, there were plenty of other MP3 players already on the market. But he held this up and said, like, do you know what this is? And I'm thinking, yeah, that's going to be an MP3 player. I don't need that. I've got my Sony Walkman, you know, my disc Walkman that's got perfect sound and it's like everything I want. I've got, yeah, I've got a stack of CDs that I carry around with me or I have in my car. I'm fine. I don't need your product. That's what I'm thinking. I didn't say it out loud. No one says that to Steve Jobs. Um, I, you know, I'm thinking, I don't need that product. But he didn't say, this is an MP3 player or this has clever digital compression. He said, you know what this is? And he said six words. This is a thousand songs in your pocket. And I thought, oh. got to have one of those. <laughs> a thousand songs? Because I don't have more than a thousand songs. I mean, the, you know, at the time I'm thinking that's the soundtrack of my entire life in that little thing, which by the way, is smaller than this, this iPhone. I gotta have one of those, right? So he took this product that was good, undeniably. A good product had that movable wheel at the time. It was pretty cool, but he took a product I didn't want and in six words, tried it into gotta have it. Right, and that's what I want from our Japanese entrepreneurs. I want them to just bring it with the very best story that they can create for their company, for their product. And I believe, and we, we coach them. We have a class called Storytelling for Startups. Um, but I believe if they could just get that a little better, it would help them raise money and find customers in Japan, help them raise money and find customers in America. Oh. So it's more like a, a mindset issue, right? It's a mindset. It gets mm. back to that book title again, right? <laughs> I, I wrote a book called Creative Confidence. Mm. Translated into Japanese, that's called Creative Mind Seto. See the word that got lost in there? Confidence. 
I believe, I know Japanese people don't believe this, but I have data. I have like Jesper Cole. I can, I can marshal data that says Japan is the most creative nation on earth. The world believes that by some metrics, by some surveys. The world believes Japan is the most creative company on earth, I mean, country on earth. Guess what? Japan doesn't believe it. <laughs> the data from Japan does not support that. No, America is more creative. Why no. is that? Is that because of a personality uh, issue, a country uh, issue? I, I mean, you could say it's humility, but this is on, a, this is on a anonymous survey. So they're not just being humble. They're, it gets down to that word that got lost in my title, confidence. Okay. I just want our entrepreneurs, our creative startup founders, to marshal their confidence, just as Ari's talking about in the you know, woman that she, women that she's helping, right? And just you know, show that, bring it to the table in a way that helps them get funding, that helps them get customers. Thank you. Uh, we have only uh, three minutes and a half, so sir. I like uh, before we go to uh, question and answer. I like uh, ask Chris about uh, how uh, would uh, Chat GDP uh, you know, impact uh, to uh, design business. Yeah, I think it's so. Um, I'm glad we we covered that earlier in the day, so we didn't have to be the first ones to say uh, <laughs> uh, generative AI or large language models. I think there is a um, an incredible opportunity. Usually, when there is such a disruption and a, and a fresh canvas. Design is, can, is, is such a great tool and mindset to be able to actually use and connect use cases and take those use cases, make a prototype, test it, and, and try it out on the way towards whatever the, the right interface is. I, I don't believe we, the, the best, I'm, I'm, I, I want to participate in as a designer and investor and enabler uh, with these large language models because I think we have, we have such an amazing canvas uh, to things to try out. We have a lot of things to work through in terms of who owns it, privacy, all of those kind of things. But what an incredible toy to, to tool. So where is this tool development? Um, and how will we start to use these um, in, in our day-to-day -day lives? I, we're going to start a little uh, a, a series of, of, of work sessions in, in our innovation center on just kind of trying them out and seeing what's, what, is, what is kind of tickles our fancy, but also go around to our big corporate uh, uh, members and, and have them try to solve a problem internal or, or external for using, using this large language models. I think that the tool and the interface to that, somebody is gonna come up with that, and it w I, I really do believe that will be design-led in the discovery or at least the process of of prototyping and refining uh, what that looks like and, and, and so how we experience it. So you don't think that uh, uh, you know, AI would not, uh, uh, would not uh, replace the designer? Well, I'm glad you said that. because I, So I used to get introduced as a design thinking speaker um, at Singularity University. And uh, my, my colleague, Salim, um, he would say, well, Chris is going to be the last one to be replaced by AI. And I sent, <laughs> I sent him a note this week and I said, clock was ticking. You know, that, it did take eight years, but um, the designer, I think if you merge this idea of, de of design thinking can be a tool for anyone, you guys can all use these tools. And I, I think somebody in an earlier panel said, There's so, it's such a great time to be an entrepreneur or an intrapreneur. Uh, a, a, as a way, because you have so many of these tools at your fingertips, all you need is that process to say, what am I, to, where's the need? What am I trying to solve? How do I create the first prototype of this? And it's so easy. All you have to do is open a browser window and try something out. I think that kind of refinement is going to be at warp speed. It has, I mean, just a year ago, we were looking at Dali trying to go from show me avocado chairs to, to where we are now. So this, this kind of gradually and suddenly is going to get even more interesting and weird in the, in the, in the next um, days and months. So I think I would say design has a, just think like a designer and try the tools. I think you're going to you know, unpack a tremendous amount of value. Good. Thank you. Just time for a question and answer. I want to take uh, the main question. So please keep it short. Uh, please raise your hand. Raise your hand. No question, Aaron? So in the trade-off between 
getting the product right versus getting the story right. Uh, where, when you're working with your clients, or particularly with startups, where do you put your emphasis? If you had to trade off one or the other, who who you want to uh, ask Tom? To? Oh, okay. Oh, sure. I mean, touche. You got to have the product right. It's just, it's not as hard as it used to be to get the product right. Okay. Oracle and Salesforce and just about every startup I worked with had a terrible product versus their competitors for a long time in the marketplace, but a really, really strong story. And the story led the company to eventually get be able, make enough business to get the product right. But uh, I imagine with your clients, you're a little more particular on what you do with the product. Well, with both our clients and with our startup companies, we would never encourage them to have the bad product. <laughs> so, but it is certainly, there's some things not quite ready for prime time, right? You have the, it's the concept of minimal viable product. You go to market, you can't wait especially as a startup. You can't wait until you have the perfect product to bring to market. You have to go to market with the product that you know has a bunch of things you want to fix later. Hopefully nothing like dangerous that you want to fix later. But, um, but you're absolutely right about that and there of the story. Um, Can I but, just take on that? Yeah. The difference at Oracle at the end of the day, which the difference at Oracle at the end of the day was the IBM investment. And the difference at Intel at the end of the day and at Microsoft at the end of the day was the IBM investment. And the wording was always the same. We've received an investment from a large corporate whose name we cannot identify. It's like, it's the, like the references to the government. We received an investment from a Japanese government agency whose name we can't identify. So that was, that was the real key. We, we invested in a relational database competitor of Oracle who had a better product. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. But Oracle won. Who is We have done research. Globis has done research about 10 years ago of creativity. And then data show that Japan was perceived as the most creative country in the world. And uh, your data idea say the same. Why is it? Like, why do you think is the root of the creativity of Japan? You know about Japanese culture. And why do you think it happened? Well, I mean, there's a hundred ways to answer that. I mean, if you look at the design tradition, you know, my company was started in 1978. When did the design tradition start in Japan? A couple of thousand years earlier, right? So there's a very long tradition of design in Japan um, and refinement of that and incredible dedication to making things perfectly, right, in the representation of that. Um, so there's that. But I mean, another data point I would say is, in my role at IDEO, I have sent more than 100 people off to Japan for their first trip. And let me just say, OK, including Chris Cowart, and let me just say 100%, I mean this without hesitation, 100% of them came back just gushing about, A, what an amazing place Japan was in general, but B, the, the design aesthetic, that everything, and I don't mean just the physical design of things, of shoji panel, the, the designed experience, the omotenashi service, the, you know, the way people interact with you, right? And so I just think Japan is amazing. And as someone who really, really loved Japan, I have to say that not all of that long tradition of design or that amazing services, service has translated into the digital world. And I think there's a lot of work to be done, and we want to help both as an investor and as a design consultancy in bringing that specialness of Japan into the digital world. Uh, because it's not always, doesn't live up to the incredibly high design standard that, that Japan has about everything else. I love at the G1 Summit that Horizon gets the 30-second timer as well. So that's good. <laughs> I think just to build on that question, I think there's a part of creativity around craft of design and refinement and that tradition um, in, in, in the entrepreneurial nature in, in Japan. On the flip side of that, how, what, why does that get somehow changed in the corporate setting? And I think we should all ask ourselves that question. We see that with our, with our, with our clients and our members. Why does that get shifted? And that is, we, we have some really interesting conversations with HR leaders in, in big, big Japanese companies and they, um, about the role of the Japanese entrepreneur. How do you get somebody to start and step outside of their acceleration pathway 
um, risk areas. How do you get people to take that risk internally? Somehow that has been squashed. It's beautiful outside of the, the big company and somehow that, that uh, we need to work to unlock that. I, I just wanna add, um, Japanese culture is very relational, which is, I can't say I'm a beautiful. You have to wait till voting how many people think I'm a beautiful. So that, because of the Japanese culture resides on the relational, no matter how creative they are, they have to wait till receive an award. Uh, so one of the uh, yeah. main uh, concept that I, I teach my entrepreneur is you say, I choose, I choose. So I choose this chair or I choose this pen and I don't have to explain because I chose because I like it. I don't care what you think, but I choose. So the power of choosing and claiming that that means this to me, this is innovative, this is beautiful. I teach those mindset to high school girls as well as entrepreneurs because without you valuing yourself and having a confidence to walk through and convincing other people, you cannot be entrepreneur. So maybe that's something is to say you can choose and you can be proud and without waiting for the approval. Maybe that could be some beginning to having a confidence. Yeah, that's true. So, another questions? No questions? Then maybe I, I wanna ask more, okay? Uh, you know, we didn't talk uh, much about uh, the, uh, we, we've been talking about the design, particularly for uh, startups, but not for, uh, you know, established uh, companies. Why is that? Is that because, uh, uh, diff uh, you know, it's difficult for a uh, big company to to utilize uh, design thinking? No, well, I just, from my, from my standpoint, we, I've been talking about startups because that's where I spend all of my time. There. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, I, yeah, for 30, more than 30 years, I focus on big companies. And they can totally do this. Uh, and and I do has a big global business consulting with mainly large companies. Uh, just startups, I've been Focusing on that recently, and startups are more fun. That's the that's the only reason uh, for me. Chris, yeah, I think there's an interesting. I mean, it, it, this is uh, I, I would say this to to U.S. big companies as well that kind of can't get out of their own way in terms of developing um, innovations from within. I'm I'm definitely a big believer of for big companies to have a multi strong multi prong innovation strategy where you should be able to buy innovation and you should be able to to home grow it. When you are home growing it, there are some, um, it, it seems easier in a US uh, company to have had a couple of successes inside the company and somehow get the funding and the team and the resources to be able to go out and say, I'm gonna start a CVC or I'm gonna start an innovation lab over here or I'm gonna try a spin out business. And somehow that pitch does not ring true inside the, the, the Japanese companies as well. I'd still like to get to the root of that, I'm still, I'm at, our, my hypothesis is that we can empower that through entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs, I'd love through, during the breaks and throughout the day for you guys to help me think through what is the right word for entrepreneur. That is the totally Silicon Valley, you know, flip between uh, entrepreneur and intrapreneur. Um, but that kind of entrepreneurial mindset is the piece that we have seen as evidence of when we work with companies thinking about this, this personal transformation that they go through and that they will never be the same in terms of being able to work inside their companies. Hopefully they stay inside their company and continue that, that, that passion, but I think that that is a huge unlock that, that we could work on together. Thank you. Oh, okay. So one of the ways I've used Tom, I, I keep selling your company, <laughs> is that um, we have, uh, we get everyone together and he leads these brainstormings and we always have brainstormings with the entire company um, on new products. And we throw up literally thousands of ideas and chase them down. And it's not just one day. We vote on what are great ideas and we have people follow through on seeing those. So it's, it's like going to the same restaurant every day and seeing the menu. It's, it's not fun, it's eat or be eaten. It's fun to come up with new products, even if you've been around for 10 or 20 years. Yes, Paul. It, 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 it's funny, um, you know, new products. You know, you know, in in Japan, every twelve days, a new soft drink is launched. <laughs> every twelve 
fucking days, yeah. right? Um, you know, so I, I want to ask you a question in this whole design thing, right? Um, what's the difference between Kaizen and innovation? Because, you know, industrial Japan, right, in terms of incremental change, perfection, relentless, every bloody day. Champagne. Oh. Well, I, yeah, I know. Good. Okay, you get you get German champagne. Anyway, the difference between no, the, sorry. The, re, the reason I bring this is a Majimina question because you know we live in American concepts, right? Innovation for innovation's change, which is fine, but there is internal strengths in Japan. So, what's the difference between innovation and kaizen? So, sure, I, I'm happy to take it. Go ahead. So I, I would say I wouldn't use the word difference in that sentence. In the Venn diagram of there's innovation, which is a big circle, and Kaizen is absolutely positively a form of innovation. I say this as someone who almost every car I've ever bought in my life has been a Toyota. They came with that Toyota production system, and it pr makes a pretty darn good car. Right, uh, every, literally every television I have ever bought is a Sony. So I believe in that Kaizen model of make it continuously better, and that is a form of innovation. It, that form of innovation doesn't necessarily get you to the iPod, or it doesn't get you to the new business models that have, that have you know, when we come to digital transformation of industries, it's typically not you know, tweaking a new product, it's typically reinventing a business model. You know, Uber, Airbnb, I know neither of those are very popular in Japan, but they've got, a, you know, tens of billions of dollars of, of value, right? And so the Kaizen model, from my experience, and you may have examples where it does, but from my experience, doesn't lead you to that, to that breakthrough that takes you to the new level, and then you, and then you fine tune at the new level, and then you need to take another leap. Chris? Okay. And one of, the, one of the things I think we are as a challenge for us as leaders is figuring out how to do both of those things at the same time and in your same organizations, whether you're a big company trying to figure out how to, to get to that next level or, or an entrepreneur who's accessed one TAM and is now trying to figure out how to grow or, or move to another, This whether you want to call it ambidextrous or just trying to figure out how to amplify one of your business units and still look for new growth. You have to figure out the right talent process, but also incentives, incentives for uh, that is typically the way that the, the business units and, and, and my observation of Japanese companies thinking they're so good at Kaizen and optimizing those business units, it, it really makes it hard to, to do the, the new growth because then you measure it against these, um, the, the, the current standards. It's really challenging. I agree with what both of you are saying. So um, one of our, uh, our cherished values is, is innovation, and that includes Kaizen. And we pay people more who innovate. Um, so people submit bonus, um, I guess it's their bonuses. They write, do, they do write-ups of their coworkers who have innovated, and a lot of them are Kaizen-like innovations they just get paid more money, people who innovate. And part of it is coming up with something new, making something more efficient. So as far as I'm concerned, they're both valuable. Thank you very much. Uh, one more question, if I may. OK, Isaka-san. Very quickly, we have only two minutes. Um, question for Horia-san. Um, is there anything you have learned working with female entrepreneurs or startups that can be incorporated or implemented into existing organizations trying to bring females up the ranks? Yeah, um, I, I think it's, a, it's all around a systemic issue. So instead of focusing on fixing women, uh, <laughs> am I too direct? <laughs> Uh, but it's systematically what kind of shogai uh, uh, butsu, the roadblock. Because one way that you get better and stronger and succeed, but the other ways women has a lot of shogai butsu, all those uh, destruction. 
And so one is to also paying attention. Because uh, often we ended up uh, looking at efficiency and motto ganbaru and work harder. Uh, but the other way is systemically what's pulling them down. Uh, it sometimes is, is much better for not just for women. If you can do that, then men too benefit uh, just all around. So looking at the shogai butsu is, I think it's a quick things you could do in all level. Yeah. And, and men. Start questioning is what we have currently might be a very macho model. And if you can start identifying it, you can have a space to create new design for non macho or whatever that might be, neutral. <laughs> well, I, I have this woman from academia that if you have more diversity, then it relates to more innovation. Yes, yes. 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 yeah, okay. Okay, uh, we uh, run out of time, so uh, we uh, we made a uh, lot of discussion, but I'm happy to uh, uh, end uh, uh, you know in uh, in a good manner. So thank you very much for everybody to give a big.